Purdue, who is a professor of electro and electrical university. Um, and he's best known or well known for his work on networks. He has established himself as a leader, uh, as a teacher, a researcher, an inventor, and an entrepreneur. He has more than 20 patents. Uh, so we are very honored to mm-hmm. feature Steve Hansen. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me uh, see uh, how many of you are freshmen. Raise your hands, please. Sophomores. Okay. Juniors. All right. Seniors. All right. Beyond seniors. Uh, well, uh, 21 years after freshmen. That's me. <laughs> So, uh, well, uh, but I still remember my uh, days as an undergrad student, uh, and uh, those were truly amazing years of my life, right? I had no mortgage, I uh, had no kids, uh, a lot of dreams, uh, somebody else is paying my bills, uh, and uh, I just get to enjoy uh, all kinds of fun stuff uh, in college, and uh, I get to take classes I, I want to take, and if they don't fit the plan of study, I just go petition to somebody. I'm not encouraging you to do that, by the way, especially if you're a senior already. Uh, and I just, uh, you know, uh, would go to listen to whatever talks I want to uh, listen to. It was, uh, it was a good time. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, you are at Purdue, uh, enjoying your college years here. And you are in Apex, uh, really a proud part of our College of Engineering tradition. Uh, in fact, I can tell you that in my previous employer, a part of my job was uh, running the Keller Center for uh, Engineering Education Innovation. And uh, part of that was to copy and paste exactly Purdue's Apex program. Uh, I know that uh, the Apex program here over the past two decades and more have been copy and pasted to many institutions, dozens of them in the consortium, impacting the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Uh, So this is such a proud part of the rich heritage that we share at Purdue Engineering. Now, I don't know uh, how many such uh, uh, conversations you have uh, as part of your leadership uh, program, as leaders of the various teams across the years. but I can pretty much assure you today is going to be the most boring one. Right? Uh, and uh, I don't know about you, I'm pretty hungry. So uh, <laughs> I still got a 5 o'clock and then I can eat. So you might be thinking about the same. You know? uh, so let's try to make this as interesting as I can. Uh, uh, it's going to be a challenge for me, but I'll try. I'll try to keep my remarks short. Uh, I'm usually not good at keeping my remarks short. Uh, but, uh, and then leave time for a conversation uh, with you and hear your questions, hear your thoughts on what do you think leadership entails, and leadership in engineering entails. Uh, well, how short would my presentation be? I'll say let's try to keep it under two minutes, okay? Not counting the past three minutes. Uh, uh, well, I think first of all, uh, uh, engineering has the potential of changing the boundary conditions of human lives in this century and beyond. Right? So in our hands, in your hands, uh, more than mine, we have the ability to change how people work and study and live and play and look at all kinds of amazing things that have happened, some from Purdue Engineering, that have changed the way that we live our lives. Uh, how long we get to live our lives, how healthy do we get to do that? Uh, engineering is a broad field, and it goes from the nanoparticles all the way to the healthcare engineering delivery, okay, from the hardware to the software. So we have some special opportunity and responsibility here. And secondly, what well, leadership for me is something very fuzzy. I don't know how to describe it. Sort of you, 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 uh, you know it when you see it, and when you see the results, when you see the delivery. And it's much more than the PowerPoint. And indeed, I have seen many PowerPoints gathering dust and not delivering because you don't have the right team at the right place. So that is my uh, only message is it comes down to who before what. 
I sometimes tell my startup team that I really don't care even what. Uh, I care about the who. I've never seen great teams not execute. It all comes down to execution. And if you have the team that can work together, high caliber, stable, complementary, um, then they will pivot and get results. Who before what? So look around, look in your team, look at the people that you have. Uh, it's not about the what, it's about the who. That's my remarks. Questions now? Comments? This could be the shortest lecture you ever had. You know, at least that's one good thing about, uh, about this lecture is it's, it's a short. But, uh, uh, well, let's see if there are questions and comments. Question for me about uh, Purdue Engineering or about uh, leadership engineering in general. Please. Um, you mentioned uh, engineers being able to change the boundaries of everyday human life. Mm -hmm. And also, you are an inventor. I was mm -hmm. wondering, what have you done maybe to change the boundary of human life? Yeah, well, you know, I've done very little. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, um, brick by brick, you know, the, the brick that I was involved as part of a team, for example, you know, was this uh, a method that can um, enable zero rating of wireless uh, data. So uh, in the United States, uh, you know, a lot of us, we don't care about the price we pay to uh, get our cellular data, right? But in many developing countries, uh, those are substantial amount of money to a family. And uh, uh, sometimes you've got people who are willing to subsidize. It could be employers, it could be advertisers, e-commerce providers, and so on, right? They say, all right, you know, we're happy to pay for the postage of these bytes. Uh, and how can we configure the telecommunication system so as to enable a flexible and accurate byte counting? depending on who is subsidizing you. Okay? And that is a platform uh, that uh, came out of my lab at Princeton. And working with my postdocs and students, we uh, filed the patent based on the research and the paper. We uh, formed a startup company. And the company now, with this professional team, several years later, uh, are, are delivering this uh, flexible zero rating or sponsored data or toll-free, open toll-free solution to mobile users uh, around the world. Uh, 35 million people are using it in six continents today. Yes, please. Mm, room for improvement, mm -hmm. is that right? For Purdue Engineering College? Well, first of all, <laughs> we are in a great position. Uh, we have a proud heritage. Uh, well, this new Armstrong Hall of Engineering, wait, what greater honor and joy can an engineer have to walk through a door with Neil Armstrong statue next to you, the small step that he took 48 years ago that inspired many more smaller steps by all of us. Uh, we are ranked among the top 10 for many years, uh, according to some magazines. And uh, uh, what's more important is that uh, we are perceived by our peers and employers uh, and parents, uh, partners out there uh, as extremely strong engineering college, one of the largest in the nation. Uh, we've got great momentum, um, but at the same time, you know, we have uh, uh, continuous challenges, for example, education front. We have the scale that is uh, incredible. Uh, counting ABE students, over 89 8,900 students uh, right now, right? over 2,000, around 2,000 uh, during the BGR uh, for freshman class. Uh, very few uh, universities out there have this kind of scale. And we're proud of the land-grant mission and the uh, fact that we're educating so many future Boilermaker engineers. At the same time, to maintain scale and quality and innovation, a triangle of education forward without giving in on any one of them, that is a challenge we have to face. Uh, Research-wise, again, we have 45 research centers, 10 preeminent teams, four major labs like Zucker and Bowen and Herrick, uh, and Flex Lab to open. Um, we have outstanding faculty. Uh, 
uh, people who are really rewriting uh, the frontiers of engineering research. But again, at the same time, uh, we are in an environment where the research funding is in a, a tough position nationwide. We're in an environment where um, the translation from fundamental research to commercial product and impact on society uh, is getting uh, faster and faster. Uh, we're in an environment where uh, we have to catch up with the equipment and facilities that these faculty require, and we always have to compete against our peers. You know, the Georgia Tech, Michigan, Berkeley, MIT, Stanford, and so on, for the very best faculty and graduate students, in addition to the undergrads. So there are these continuous challenges that we embrace. And uh, you know, together with the leadership team I have in the college and the schools in the college, uh, to try to find the right vision and strategy, the right execution, uh, road maps. Um, but if you look at the future, uh, I think that we have an extremely bright future. Uh, we have people who are capable, people who are hungry, and people who are humble. Uh, this is a truly unique feature. Uh, perhaps part of the Midwest philosophy here that the boilermakers they get the job done, they are rock solid technically, creative minds, and then they don't brag and they don't whine, they don't complain. Right? That's part of the reasons why the employers love uh, to hire uh, alumni that we have uh, produced. Uh, so, you know, long story short, you know, the, uh, the challenges I think education with scale, quality and innovation, and research infrastructure and environment that can continue to attract and retain the brightest talents out there. Yes, please. Just out of curiosity, in your opinion, um, when somebody is graduating from the College of Engineering, mm. what do you think is the most important thing that they take that with them? What's your main goal mm -hmm. from freshman to senior that somebody's going to develop as a Purdue Engineering student? Mm -hmm. Well, I forgot who said this, but that uh, you know, education is what you retain after you've forgotten all the knowledge you learned. Okay. Uh, so first of all, you know, 21 years since my freshman year, I can uh, report to you that uh, uh, I have forgotten every knowledge I learned. Uh, so I examine what, what do I still remember? Uh, it's really uh, the mindset and the learning capability. Okay. It's about the mindset to understand engineering as a large, complex, uh, process, how do you modularize, uh, how to define interfaces, uh, how do you sharpen the problem statement, right? how do you peel off the problem statement one by one until you get to the core of it. Uh, there are big ideas behind engineering. Uh, I have forgotten how to take Z and Fourier and Laplace transforms. Uh, how many of you have heard of those things? Raise your hands. Or maybe all, you all have taken some courses related to that, uh, but I still remember the time frequency duality, the mindset that, uh, you know, when I talk, you can look at the so-called frequency domain and see the different frequency components, right? And there is a certain way to think about the duality between the time and frequency, back and forth. That is a powerful idea, and that idea stays with me. Another part, of it, I, I hope, <laughs> still with me is the ability to uh, pick up new things uh, on my own. Right? We uh, should be training people for their mindset and their ability to learn without teachers. Because uh, learning doesn't stop, it keeps on going. Uh, and the more capable you are to remain curious and be able to learn new things on your own, uh, than the longer of an education that you have. So it's not really about how much we cover as instructors, but how much we together with students uncover uh, so that they remain curious and they still want to learn. They still feel that learning is a joyful process. Uh, well, so I think if you have some of those big ideas and mindsets with you and you still have that curiosity and the eager uh, and the ability to learn new things, then uh, uh, say that's very good education. Yes, please. So uh, you mentioned uh, changing the boundaries between discipline and school and life. 
Yes. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, diversity and inclusion comes in different important shapes. Uh, and uh, underrepresented minority is a big part of that. The, the, the female for engineering is a big part of that. Uh, Social economic background is a big part of that. First generation college student is a big part of that. Uh, and um, if you look at the tuition freeze that Purdue has been doing for what, six years in a row, right? Uh, and I hope that you are all, whether you're in-state, out-of-state, international students, benefit from that over the past you know, one, two, or three years. Uh, all the higher education institutions talk about, oh, this is incredible curve. You know, well, why don't we draw a curve? Because I feel it's an uh, engineering class, right? We need a curve. We've got some numbers here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, you've got a curve here now, right? So they say, all right, this is time, right, in the years. Uh, and then this is dollar amount. Well, gee, I haven't actually uh, written on the blackboard with the, with the chalk for a lot, long, long time. This feels good. This feels good. <laughs> all right. So they say, you know, uh, the, in general, there's inflation, all right? So whatever costs you $10, now it costs you more over the years. But then, oh, look at... You know, higher education, right? They look at that curve and say, well, the rate is a lot steeper. So everybody talks about, let's bend this curve, let's bend it. But, uh, well, everybody's going like that except Purdue. I think that is remarkable. That is a remarkable curve, not only to talk about it, but to walk the walk. Uh, and President Daniels' signature uh, is to make sure that uh, college in a public land grant university remains affordable. Uh, and that is important to inclusion and diversity. If we look at our minority engineering program, women engineering program, uh, we have some tremendous history here. This is the founding site of NSB. Uh, this is the, I think, first women engineering program in the nation. Uh, I was told the first female engineer we graduated was in, guess when, 1897. I bet some of you were not born <laughs> in 1897. Uh, and uh, it's, of course, for many decades, we only have a handful every year. Uh, now, now, today, I think among the faculty, we have 82 female faculty members. We have 25% among the undergrads, female students. The uh, underrepresented minority number also is going through an encouraging trend. The absolute number is still uh, not high enough uh, for a lot of us, but uh, the trend is encouraging. In fact, this year, if you look at the first year enrollment number, the graduation number, and the retention uh, across four or five year cohort, all of those numbers hit historic record high this year. Okay. So we're doing something right in the past and today, but there are still miles to go. Right? Uh, and part of that is the pipeline going to K-12. Like I was just talking with uh, the dean of the Polytechnic Institute, and you know that they opened this high school in inner city Indianapolis. Uh, we got to build the pipeline. We got to work with other pipelines. There's a summer workshop, for example, every year organized by our minority engineering program. We've got to build a sense of community so that they feel that they also belong here. Uh, it is not how you look that matters, but what you do. And uh, uh, for example, we have, uh, uh, I think, a tantalizingly close target of uh, 50-50 in the Honors College women uh, engineering population. Uh, today, we are 42% in the Honors College of engineering female <coughs> students. Uh, and I think that uh, we will hit that 50-50 fairly soon. Uh, so a lot more for us to do together, uh, but I'm encouraged by a lot of the trend that uh, we're seeing today. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Purdue, and this is your first time being with Board of Regents, so if you mm-hmm. this is your first time here, like what things have you done to be successful and mm-hmm. connected to the organization? Yes, oh, well, uh, indeed, you know, on July 1, that was uh, four months and five days ago, um, I uh, became a proud Boilermaker uh, and Hoosier. Uh, and I've heard of Purdue Engine. I've been here uh, as a faculty member uh, giving talks and meeting colleagues for many years. Uh, one of my grand uncles is a, a Purdue mechanical engineer graduate in the 40s. Uh, I've always had great admiration, but uh, now I need to understand the culture, the history, the who, and the what, and the why, and the how uh, in a lot more depth. Um, so part of what I did was to A, uh, commit, and I'm now fulfilling this commitment, to meet every single faculty member one-on-one. Briefly, each one of them, but one-on-one, every one of them. And guess how many faculties do we have? We have 456 professors in the College of Engineering. So uh, I think I'm almost 300. I'm getting there. Uh, My hope is if not by the end of the, this year, in you know, early 2018, I'll get there. And I learned so much talking one-on-one with these faculty members. Uh, some you know, bring a request with them. Some you know, complain about certain things. But their requests and their complaints, as well as their suggestions, observations, are all very informative. Now, secondly, I started a walking tour with Robert Frosch, the associate dean for facilities. And uh, so I sit down with Robert and say, you know, how many uh, buildings do we have in Purdue Engineering? The answer is somewhere between 28 and 30, depending on how you count. So, all right, that's 1.17 million square feet. And I say, well, I'm not going to walk every single square foot of it, but uh, I would like to be in every building. Uh, so we uh, carved out the map into six zones. And over summer and early part of fall, uh, we together uh, uh, went to all of them. Uh, that was a lot of walking, I have to tell you. you know, since July 1, I stopped going to gym. So the other day, I was in Amelia. And then uh, you know, uh, another colleague came up to me and said, hey, mom, you, know, uh, you, know, you, you eat a lot of unhealthy food, you know, ice cream and uh, you know, pappies and silver dipper and uh, chips and all that, and say, you know, so, so you, know, you go to gym and say, uh, no, I, I, well, I wish I could have time, but, uh, but now it's all right because I just go on walking tour with Robert. Uh, <laughs> so now Robert started a fitness program for the, no, no, he, he's busy with other things. So uh, I learned a lot walking around. Uh, and I do actually sort of random walk uh, every week. I literally randomly walk. So if you see somebody looking like me, you know, apparently lost and holding a map like a tourist, uh, good chance that is me. Uh, so uh, some of the facilities are amazing. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been to Martin Jiski Hall, Biomedical Engineering, Bowen Lab, Zucker Lab. We have the dedication of expansion. Back to Innovation Design Center. As a student, you've got to go there. Um, Flax Lab that's unveiling soon. Uh, and some of them uh, you know, would require more updates, you know, like some space in Hampton Hall and mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, in Potter. Um, thirdly, I uh, have this open door office hour. In fact, it's posted somewhere on, online, and, and, and uh, uh, you're welcome to come and, uh, uh, and talk to me as well. Uh, it's open to all faculty, staff, students. I have town hall meetings. The next one is December 1. Okay, so let me do some commercial here. Uh, <laughs> I forgot what time is it, but it's... Uh, uh, email me, chan at purdue.edu, I'll, I'll reply you. Uh, I uh, also started meeting a lot of alum. Uh, I've been to Chicago, Indianapolis, Bay Area, Seattle, Hong Kong with uh, President Daniels last week. My goal is to hit 15 uh, cities in the 15, first 15 months of my job. Um, and uh, I started sitting in classes. I sat in MSC 190. Uh, because they told me they will make ice cream in class. <laughs> and uh, I had to go to another meeting. So by the time I left, they haven't gone to the ice cream part. But I learned a bit more about metallic properties and so on, things that I've forgotten from my freshman year. Uh, so all of those uh, was extremely helpful. 
uh, to know more about the culture here, the great people doing great work here, uh, and to understand more about the nuances and the complexities of what we, what we have here. Um, and um, if you are just in the commercial mood here, uh, you haven't followed me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Purdue Eng Dean, so Purdue E N G Dean, um, and I regularly uh, tweet somewhat important news about our college. And uh, I would love to also, you know, follow you and uh, retweet a lot of great things you might be writing about. So, long answer to your question. Uh, yes, please. Mm. You compare our uh, admission rate to other top engineering schools, mm. it tends to be a little bit higher percentage. And then after the first year, I see a lot of students end up dropping out of engineering, trying to see rigor. Mm. So how can we still keep a high reputation among other engineering colleges while still having such a high admission rate? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, admission is above my pay grade. But having said that, uh, uh, you raised an important question with two dimensions to it. Right? One dimension is how can we help our admitted students uh, and uh, improve our retention rate and time to graduation. Uh, and on that front, you know, uh, I think that we are working closely with the School of Engineering and Education. Where putting more learning analytics around it to detect problems ahead of time, personalize learning more, uh, and try to maintain uh, the uh, ability to innovate uh, and to encourage uh, students through the tough time. It is a tough program, I have to tell you. Compared to many peer institutions, we don't water down things. And uh, it's easy for me to say that. I don't have to take exam anymore. Uh, well, you know, I don't even have to write exams anymore, but you have to take exams and you can tell me. Uh, I think it's pretty tough. A lot of alum keep telling me that, uh, well, the toughest part of my life was Purdue engineering education. All right. Uh, but I survived it. And uh, once I survived that, I can survive anything. I can survive jobs, grad school, MBA, mortgage, marriage, kids, you know, all kinds of challenges in life. And, uh, on the one hand, we want to maintain quality. On the other hand, we uh, want to uh, give everybody the resources that uh, they need to have a fair chance to succeed. Uh, it shouldn't be just the survival uh, mode of operation. Now, the other dimension of your question is, um, should we uh, admit fewer students? On that note, I think there's a fundamental philosophical difference between private universities and public land-grant universities. Uh, and I'm proud of the public land-grant uh, mission that we have here. It's a heritage that I think we should continue, uh, is to make sure that education uh, of Purdue engineering education opportunity, that quality, uh, that lies transforming opportunities, so many alum keep telling me that, you know, Purdue Engineering changed my life. Right? I'm a first generation college student or, you know, I came from uh, a humble background, but Purdue Engineering gave me the chance to reinvent my life, my family's lives. And uh, um, we should be proud of that. We should try our best to say that, you know, there's a certain bar of excellence in order to be admitted as, uh, as a freshmen to Purdue Engineering, but let's not make this too high. Let's give more people a chance to receive their education and prove themselves, uh, rather than trying to go up in ranking by admitting fewer. Uh, 